But before we do that, I want to talk about how you actually enter into a community. Because Jesus gives us some very powerful things to think about in Luke chapter 10. And we've actually taken some things and laid them out here in something called the letter I's. So let's start with how you enter a local community. First of all, when we get started, I want you to to think about um, in your community, take your time. As you're getting started, don't just start racing out to try to get things done. My, my, My recommendation to you is, first of all, just take your time, build a prayer team, have people that are ready to pray, ready to kind of go ahead of you, Uh, fight the spiritual battle with you. And then when you go into the community, actually prayer walk in your community. It could be if your heart's for orphans or for HIV AIDS or for human trafficking or for the poor, just begin to prayer walk in those areas among those peoples and just lift lift them up before Jesus and say, we know your heart's broken for them. You've broken our heart for them. And we just want to continue to lift them up and pray. Second is look for persons of peace. Um, This isn't something that you have to go out and say, are you a person of peace? Are you a person of peace? There are people you just engage in conversations when when you're learning and you actually ask people, hey, can you tell me about the orphans in this area or the poor in this area, the homeless, the people who've been left behind educationally? Can you tell me who they are? Why have they been left behind? What's been happening? And so you're in discovery. And so you want to take your time and begin to discover those things. And then also you're ultimately looking for partners, people that will also come along and uh, be involved with you. So remember as you're starting, you're really in a pilot phase. In a pilot phase, you want to start small. Uh, you want to be building your, your leadership base and best practices. And you can get to churchwide later and what churchwide looks like where you add a whole lot more partners and uh, we'll talk about how you can actually do a campaign that sometimes can lift a whole community together to get involved. So let's go to point one of entering a community. First thing we say is intentionally engage the church. The local church is the beginning, the middle, and the end of every piece work. Ensure that it's local church initiated. Now, this is so important um, because when you get started, Not only is your church already in the community, but often there are many other churches involved in the community, and these are people that you want to connect with, um, especially as you get to church-wide. In the beginning, maybe as a pilot, you're just getting started, but look for other churches to involve in this as well. Second, identify the needs. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, try to identify the other assets in the community. Sometimes people go out and say, well, we saw people with these needs and these needs and these needs but they didn't take the time to find out there are a lot of other things out there that are providing for people that are in need. So find out the other assets that are out there. Could be a government agency is providing things. Could be another organization or churches are providing things. And that's great. You don't have to duplicate their efforts. You can look for gaps um, later on, but determine not only what the assets are, but, but the ownership through local leaders, the knowledge of the real challenges, and begin to discover Um, what's out there and who's out there already. Next thing you want to do is um, discover indigenous solutions. Did you know that uh, wherever you go in the world, whether it's your community, whether it's among the poor or the wealthy, um, it's amazing the creativity that God has put in people. And it doesn't matter their their status in life or their, their economic or social status. It's incredible the amount of intelligence, the creativity, And people often know the solutions to their own problems. They just don't know how to get there. And so we really encourage indigenous solutions. Uh, We say resources are in the harvest. As you raise up indigenous leadership, they will find their own resources. It's remarkable when people are looking for solutions and they have their ideas and they say, well, we need a little bit of resources. And the first thing we teach them to do is look to God for resources. What that does is that keeps us from being a God in their life. There's something that was... Uh, written in Walking with the Poor, a book um, that uh, talked about the God complex of the non-poor. And the last thing we want to do is go into the community and in any way try to uh, have them feel like we're the solution to their problems. Um, God's the ultimate solution to their problems. And when they get out of poverty or they get into a permanent home as an orphan or they get the help they need, they're thanking God and worshiping him because of it. They're not turning around and going, well, that great person over there was the one who saved me. So um, as you get, as you move through and you identify needs, uh, you begin to see that uh, there are indigenous solutions. 
what you want to do is, is look at, and you see a, a worldview tree, a biblical worldview that empowers people, is that uh, worldview makes all the difference in the world. I'm going to show you that in, in this diagram, it talks about in this tree that the fruit are the consequences of something, the branches are behavior, the trunk are values, and the roots are beliefs. And what this means is, is that the beliefs of a person and a community results in certain values that they have, which results in certain behaviors, which results in consequences. And too often we go into a community and we see consequences and we start to address the consequences without finding out the root causes. What we're trying to do is actually help grow healthy people and as a result of that, healthy cultures. So remember, one of the reasons why step one and step two are so important is we say that healthy churches are producing healthy members. And healthy members can go into the community and help people there get healthy. And the more healthy people are in a community, the more they'll be healthy cultures. So oftentimes cultures look like this tree on the left side where uh, there's no fruit. And the tree's kind of scrawny, and in the, in the soil, in the, the ground around it, it's just filled with, with beliefs that are lies. They're just untruth. And so, for example, one example I, I like to use is that oftentimes in a culture, um, they say that some people are of less value than others. That's their belief system. Some people are less value than others. It could be because of... Uh, uh, status in the community, could be because they speak a certain language, could be they've come from somewhere else, but they're less important. Some actually even have a value that, that uh, people, people are biblically of a different value. And so it's just, it's a lie. It comes from the enemy. And the trunk, the values of that is that because of that, some should be valued as less important. That if you're, if you have less value, then you should be treated as less important. And then that translates into branches or behavior that some should not have equal access to resources, for example. They don't deserve it. Uh, they're here from another country. They don't deserve it. Uh, they're from a different socioeconomic status. They don't deserve it. And so we see that in communities. And then the fruit of that is poverty, illiteracy, sickness, and disease. And so when you, when you have that, you want to not just see, well, we have poverty here or illiteracy here or darkness here. But say, what's the root cause? And when you see a root cause that's a lie, that's not true, as healthy people that are connected to God, connected to others, uh, even connected to self and understanding self, then we're able to help other people see that this is how we can help them out of that darkness, help them out of that poverty, and help them begin to uh, find in Christ an identity that is as valuable as somebody else. So we always want to understand what the root causes are as we go into the community and as much as possible address root causes because when you address those, you see fruit that remains. And that's our heart. That's our heart for people that are suffering. They're living in unjust conditions. And you know what? We're not okay with that. We're not okay with that. Injustice and, and, and suffering are not okay. And that's why we continue to go. And it's okay to go and help people temporarily, but ultimately our heart is to help them out of that and to get fully healthy themselves. And then fourth, we say implement holistically. Transformation is about moving beyond just outputs toward complete transformation. And the only way to get there is to holistically care about people. In Matthew chapter 22 and Matthew chapter 28, you see the Great Commission, the Great Commandments, and oftentimes people debate um, which one's more important. And what we say is both are important. Both are important. That we have to go and, and share our faith. We have to go and take care of people's needs. And um, it's caring about the whole person. And there's, there's tension between that. There's tension between temporal needs and eternal needs. And we hold those in tension. But at the end of the day, when we step into a community, our commitment is to make mission more about relationships than resources. Mission is primarily about coming alongside of people in their journey in life and helping them get from where they are today to where God wants them to be. And sometimes that takes weeks, sometimes that takes months or years, but when we go into the community, especially our own communities, we're saying, we are here with you. 
We want to be among you. We want to dwell with you. We want to help you just not just beyond your economic place in life, but also your health, your spiritual life. These are all important. I love the fact that, that some people are able to say, we're going to provide a cup of water and get them clean water. And then they might say, but we're also going to add Jesus. I'm 100% in favor of that. Others say, well, we're going to go out and do literacy and add Jesus. I'm all in favor of that. Others say, well, we're going to go out and do um, health care and we'll add some Jesus. Well, I love all that, but you know what? We can take it further because with the church in the community and the members mobilized, we can come alongside of those people and say, it might start with health care. It might start with even talking about Jesus. It might start with education. It might start with economic development for the poor. But as we journey in life with them, our heart is to get them connected to a body of Christ that's healthy and to people who are healthy and to help them get, help them get holistically healthy, healthy spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially, financially. And that's what church is about. There's no other institution on the planet that God has given us that cares about people holistically and is commanded to love people unconditionally and through their whole life. So once we've kind of brought this holistic approach into the community, uh, we want to introduce resources strategically. So we're not saying that resources aren't important, but it's not the starting point and it's actually not even the most important part. We say here, doing it for them versus training them how. Don't do anything for someone they can do for themselves. Don't steal their dignity. God's the one who created them in his image. They have that identity in, in Christ, if they have Christ. They, are, they have the same image of God that, that you have. And so don't steal that dignity from them. Um, try to serve them in a way that you can teach them how to progress without just giving them something. Uh, we talk about the how and when of external resources. We're going to come to that a little bit later on the role of resources and when to introduce them. And finally, the difference between relief and development. Now, there are times where um, people are going to die without help, and we are commanded to step in and help them. So that's what we call relief. There are disasters, there are emergency situations where people need to rush in and have resources to help them right away, shelter, food, medicine, um, and that's needed right away. But then there's the long-term development of people's lives, the long-term growth of people. And so we never want to kind of blend those and say, well, we're just always going to do relief for people and then leave. Um, we'll go into situations as necessary to try to rescue and help people in their first parts of recovery, but then move them into something some might call rehabilitation or just the, the long-term um, redevelopment of their, their lives and their community. Um, we're going to stop here because what I want you to do is take some time as a group to look into Luke chapter 10. And I want you to spend some time looking at the instructions that Jesus gave the 72. And I want you to discover, as you go through the whole chapter, how many principles do you find in Luke chapter 10 that you would say, these are important things that Jesus was talking about, and these are what we can use today. Okay, turn and discuss that. <music>